Well, good morning, folks. Uh, I'm Tom Jericho. I'm a senior fellow here in the International Security Program at CSIS, and I uh, direct the, the Missile Defense Project. Uh, our event today is the Falklands at 40, uh, Reflections on Maritime Strategy and Anti-Ship Cruise Missiles. Uh, in doing some research for this, uh, a friend uh, shot me an article uh, from 2012, the 30th anniversary, uh, from, it was in Proceedings, and uh, Commander Jim Griffin wrote that the Falklands War was the first modern anti-access area denial uh, conflict. Now, of course, A2AD uh, threats have come a long way in the past uh, 40 years. Nonetheless, you don't have to try too hard to think about analogies to contemporary events and challenges, uh, be it in Ukraine or, or the issues with Taiwan. And that's part of why we're, we're hosting this today and why this event is being hosted by the CSIS Missile Defense Project. Uh, there's lessons to be learned about anti-ship missile threats and air and missile defense uh, or the lack thereof. Our first speaker today uh, is the Honorable John F. Lehman, Jr., uh, former Secretary of the Navy from 1981 to 1987 during the Reagan administration. Uh, he spent 25 years uh, in the Naval Reserve. He was a staff member, member on the NSC to Henry Kissinger, uh, hosted a, a lot of other government service, uh, and more recently was a member of the 9-11 Commission and the National Defense Commission. So we're gonna turn things over to you, Secretary Lehman, uh, for some opening remarks, then he and I will have a, a discussion, and then we'll have a, a second panel to continue continue the, the conversation. So over to you, sir. Great, thanks. It's great to be back here. Um, Thank you. The, uh, the whole resurgence of uh, uh, the forward strategy and the end of the Cold War that, uh, that began in uh, the 80s really started at what uh, the predecessor organization of CSIS, the Georgetown Center for Strategic Studies, uh, had a uh, a, a, a kind of a lunch and, or dinner uh, group, including uh, some of our distinguished uh, panel members. And uh, we would get together uh, a couple of times a month to talk about strategy, because uh, the, the nation at the time, Congress and the executive were embarked on a, a major disarmament program, reducing particularly the Navy, and, uh, and so uh, this bi bipartisan group was, sort of came together spontaneously. There was many Democrats as Republicans, but uh, all of us felt that we were headed in the wrong direction. And it wasn't just the United States, it was Europe uh, especially. In fact, the UK led the way in naval disarmament uh, when I was a student over there. Uh, the Wilson government had a, quite a debate about uh, the future of aircraft carriers, and they concluded there was no future for aircraft carriers, so they canceled them all, canceled the, the plans for new ones, and decided to early retire the old ones. Uh, so this seemed to uh, many of us here, uh, and uh, we were in various ways affiliated with the Georgetown Center, CSIS, that we needed to really think through and, and elaborate more specifically why we needed a strategy that was not uh, a passive strategy to continue uh, defensive uh, worrying about uh, the, the uh, Russian, uh, the Soviet 180 divisions and our Defense Department had become obsessive about one small theater, the Fulda Gap and the North German Plain. And Navy, what do they do? They, how can they help us? They need to help you know, bring the beans and bullets over, but uh, that, that's not part of strategy. Well, of course, uh, we uh, drew together some very, very uh, important people, some within the administration, uh, uh, but the dialogue was uh, really, uh, really good. And w what, what came out of that interaction, we, we had some war games that we put together ourselves and uh, uh, w w we, we really ca came, pulled together things, some were going on in the fleets, but more of it was really just uh, to, a concept, because all strategy, all good strategy, is simple logic. And we always said that 
look, as we develop these strategic ideas, think of how they are going to be sold because you have to make even a congressman understand uh, what you're talking about. The more esoteric, the more complicated, the more, uh, the more pages it takes to explain the strategy, the less effective it really is as a strategy. So you've got to keep, in, instead of what had become in the Navy especially, uh, strategy became, well, what, 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 what can we afford? Uh, uh, they say they're gonna cut the budget, so that's less than what we have now, so what ships should we start to retire? That really was what strategy was about in the 70s. And, and so we, we felt very strongly, all of us, it was a very bipartisan group, that strategy has to start with where, what do you want to do? Do you want to win the Cold War? Is it winnable? Uh, if so, then say so. And then build your strategy, not on what you think uh, the bureaucrats are going to give you to, to implement it and Congress will appropriate, but build your force structure. What does it take to win? And from the force structure, then build your palm. Uh, what is it, uh, uh, how many carriers do you need? How many submarines do you need? How many frigates? How many mine layers, etc.? Derive it, simple logic, uh, to a budget. And that should be the Navy budget. Now, if uh, the consolidation uh, in the Department of Defense means that the DOD uh, just laughs at the budget, uh, okay, that's, you know, that's a problem. But you should have the strategy, even if you can't get it funded in a particular administration or a particular Congress. The Navy should always have a Navy, uh, a maritime strategy that includes all the other services, participation, but to do the Navy's job of command of the seas and keeping the nation safe, the Navy must always have a strategy, not a budgetary strategy. And so in the interwar periods, the Navy was very good until after, until actually, uh, uh, the establishment of the consolidation in 1947, uh, which, by the way, included in the law that consolidated the services in the Department of Defense, that the Secretary of Defense's office must never exceed 50 people. And as we know today, uh, there are uh, 750,000 civilian FTEs in the Department of Defense. They're not all in the office of the secretary, but uh, uh, there are 30 odd independent agencies that don't report to anybody. And yet, uh, when I was secretary, they, they spent 60% of the Navy budget. And we had no say. Uh, I'm gonna jump around a little bit here, uh, just to illustrate. Uh, my final point, uh, after the Falklands, we really wanted to know how good we were at defending against exocets. Uh, I, I read all of our classified reports, it was all goodness, we were, yes, we were able to clearly defend against exocets, and worse, the supersonic sea skimmers of the Soviets with, the, which are much, with a much bigger uh, shape charge warhead, but we decided no, we couldn't, we, we can't just depend on parametric studies, we're going to test them. And the Brits were in the same, uh, same boat because they had suffered some very bad hits from exosets. And so uh, we agreed on a test, a series of tests out at Point Magoo on the west coast. The Brits sent a destroyer over with a dozen exosets. We built targets of uh, uh, retired mothballed destroyers and uh, bigger ships and smaller ships. We put Sea Whiz on, we put on some, we put 
uh, sea sparrows on others. We uh, had uh, the land-based equivalent of, or, or the surface-based equivalent of the sidewinders. Uh, we had uh, Slick 32 jammers. We had Prowler aircraft up. We had F-14s with Phoenix. Uh, and, uh, and it was a realistic, real test. And uh, uh, I, I, I was being pummeled on the hill at the time uh, because, oh, uh, uh, the Falklands demonstrates surface ships can't survive. Uh, the Brits lost X, Y, Z, and uh, they, uh, the carriers didn't help them. They, were, uh, they, they kept getting pummeled by World War II bombs and blah, blah, blah. And every day I was up on the hill uh, trying to apply the logic to these, uh, let's say, less informed uh, congressional committees. So I didn't want to wait for, uh, for the seven layers of commands in between the tests and my office. So I went out there for the tests and I stayed there uh, through the testing phase. Uh, I flew uh, as a radar intercept officer in the F-14 that was used specifically to uh, track and counter every one of the missiles fired. And uh, uh, we found that it really validated the analyses that we had. Of course, as I said, since Okinawa, we had, the Navy had depended on layered defenses. Uh, going out to the, to the first uh, uh, early warning destroyer plots uh, and uh, uh, the uh, closer in to the fleet, because we, we had over a thousand ships in that battle, so it was a, a target-rich environment for the kamikazes, a very smart cruise missiles. Uh, these these uh, kamikazes, by the way, were both uh, dive bombers, fighters, uh, twin engine beddies, uh, the whole array of combat aircraft in the Japanese uh, arena and loaded with bombs, in the mo not loaded but carrying at least two 500-pound uh, bombs, every one of them. And so there were 1,700 of them that attacked the fleet over the 100 days of the battle and we suffered heavy losses uh, and, but we learned as we, uh, as we uh, uh, proceeded and uh, adapted to, as, as did the Japanese attackers, they adapted their cruise missiles to our defenses and uh, soon adopted sea skimming and uh, sudden pop-ups and a lot of other tactics. They, they were very good and very adaptable. But we learned our lessons there that you have to have layered defense. So we tested all those layers and they worked. O only one of the dozen uh, um, exosets uh, were able to get past in the testing of the CWIS, which is the Gatling gun defense. Only one of them got through. The rest were, were effectively shot down. And uh, uh, so we came away with that confirm that layered defense is even more important in the age of missile defense. So the Navy always had uh, a good layered defense. Uh, but uh, that was basically uh, the reason CSIS was able to bring together this group that was because uh, there was a feeling that many of the lessons of the previous uh, uh, 50 years had been lost and that it was, it, it was time to rejuvenate in the intellectual and the policy communities uh, the, the reality of understanding and remembering the lessons uh, learned in the past. And that's why today's uh, examination, I think, is so crucial because it's getting harder and harder uh, to keep the memory of legitimate lessons learned that are still valid. And many of the lessons 
that we learned through the years of all of the conflicts, and not just us, but the, our allies, uh, have uh, uh, been eroded because uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, as, as, uh, has now become a, a, a cliche, the uh, um, uh, uh, history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes, uh, rhymes often and regularly. And we forget, uh, we have come as institutions to forget those, those rhyming tunes. And uh, that's a real challenge, which is, I think, w one of the key lessons and uh, uh, reasons that we are here today how do we keep alive uh, the lessons uh, that we have learned with blood and tears over the last, well, you can go all the way back several hundred years, but uh, certainly in modern history, uh, we face many of the same challenges as we are seeing in uh, the Ukraine today. Uh, the the uh, cruise missile is nothing new for naval forces. Uh, it's clear the Russians either never learned the lessons, more probably, uh, or forgot them all, because almost every uh, lesson that came out of World War II and subsequent wars was ignored in, in the Moskva. And, uh, uh, and uh, the worry is that uh, uh, U.S. and Western and NATO uh, uh, navies have, uh, have forgotten uh, uh, what they should be remembering uh, in training and in equipment and in, uh, in materiel and in ship design. Uh, all of those things are Im important in naval warfare. But as we look at procurement today in the UK and in the US, in the uh, specifications for design in ships, recent ships like the LCS and the, the uh, Zumwalt uh, uh, to save money, lessons were forgotten. And so we've got to figure out a way to, to change that. Uh, the Navy always depended on layered defense. Now the Navy does not have the layered defense that it, it used to have the U.S. Navy. Uh, all of the Navy's long-range carrier aircraft were canceled. We have no more long-range uh, uh, attack, uh, fighter, interceptor, uh, strike. All of those were canceled to save money. And, uh, uh, and so instead of a seven-layer defense against supersonic cruise missiles and now hypersonic cruise missiles, we have a three-layer to, on the carrier's four-layer uh, defense. And that's not enough to the threats that we know are here now and some that are coming. So that's why we put together this distinguished panel and uh, uh, that can drill down in these uh, uh, key areas. And so uh, I'd just like to uh, uh, end this part of the overview uh, with uh, the experiences we had uh, in, uh, uh, in the Falklands, we, the U.S., and our allies. Uh, first, I uh, learned of it was a call to me from the strike fleet commander in, uh, uh, in Norfolk, and that was Admiral Ace Lyons, who uh, 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 w was very close to the Royal Navy, uh, what a lot of people don't understand is that uh, despite what politicians and academics say about the special relationship, it is very real in the maritime and in across the military field, but especially in the naval forces, the marine forces of uh, the US and the UK. It is a special relationship. We had at the time the Falklands uh, uh, decision was made, we had 50 persons, uh, officers and NCOs and uh, specialists in Northwood, the Royal Navy headquarters. 
And uh, uh, there were 150 Royal Navy personnel in the various commands in Norfolk. And uh, there was no other nation that had that kind of representation. Uh, and, and, and so the first I heard is I said, I got a call from Admiral Lyons saying, whoa, we just uh, got through uh, the normal uh, Navy to Navy channels. Uh, a request for a few unusual things. Uh, they say they have to have right away two tankers full of, uh, of uh, fuel for uh, dispatch right away to the, to the Ascension Island. They need 100 AIM-9L uh, sidewinders, which were the new sidewinders that could shoot head on instead of having to get behind the, the uh, uh, enemy aircraft. Uh, they want an aircraft carrier uh, standing by, uh, kind of unusual things, uh, moving a couple of satellites and, and, and a lot of other things. So uh, Lyons, who as uh, I would say the majority of naval officers in the US Navy have always been, uh, despite the revolution and the war of 1812, uh, have been uh, uh, very pro Brit for the most part. And uh, uh, so I said, well, don't do anything. <laughs> I think we've got to get a little higher guidance from this. So I went down to CCAP, who was the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Weinberger, and he agreed, uh, we recommended uh, uh, that, uh, uh, well, uh, Ace Lyons recommended, why don't we just handle this? They do need it. They don't have any AIM-9Ls. They're gonna run out of fuel at Ascension and won't be able to go beyond that. Uh, we've gotta help them and, and these are legitimate requests. So CAP was pretty much uh, an, a, uh, an Anglophile, uh, even a rabid Anglophile. And um, uh, he, uh, he agreed, so I, I have agreed with, uh, uh, with Ace Lines and uh, he said, I, I, I'm gonna go over and talk to the president and uh, see if we can get him to authorize handling this within uh, Sackland in Norfolk uh, and uh, I'll set up a special task group to, to work with them above all. We don't want it to get into the State Department or the, uh, far, still far worse, the Foreign Office. Uh, so uh, Cap went over to the White House, uh, laid out the pros and cons, laid out the whole menu of requests so far, and gave his recommendation uh, that uh, we, uh, we go ahead and just start handling this through existing uh, channels. Uh, because there's a normal flow of, cha that, this was not normal, but there was a, a flow of uh, uh, joint training exercises of, uh, of, of parts for uh, common uh, uh, weapon systems and so forth. So, uh, what, what of course we now know, uh, which most people didn't then, was the Argentines were running the Contra camps to counter the Soviet intrusions into Central America. And uh, while we were paying for the cost of the Contra camps to, uh, to help the opposition to the communist uh, uh, Sandinistas in Nicaragua, uh, they, it was the Argentines who were running the camps. So obviously uh, the Secretary of State uh, was under whose purview it was was desperate to try to find a, a compromise, a ceasefire, cease and he was in shuttle diplomacy constant, which uh, the British government, uh, not knowing really of what, uh, uh, what the Argentines were doing for us in running the Contra camps, uh, thought, you know, I mean, Hague was pilloried in the, in the British press. Uh, as for being pro-Argentine and so forth, calling for negotiations. Uh, and he was, he was even more an Anglophile than, uh, than Cap was. 
but he was desperately trying to keep uh, keep the uh, 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 keep having to choose between two two allies. Of course, uh, and there was no doubt in his mind if we had to choose where we would go. Uh, so that complicated things. So Cap wasn't sure really how President Reagan would come down on this because Haig was uh, very uh, working with him very closely. And he stroked his chin, uh, according to Cap, and uh, he said, give Maggie everything she wants. And that was the decision. And, uh, and so uh, uh, Cap came back and uh, he said, I, uh, I am uh, designating my top uh, uh, civilian official to handle this. And uh, Dov Zuckheim, who was the only Dov in the Pentagon, as he is proud to say, uh, became the, the project manager to do the expediting and the waiver writing and to, to enable this to go right away because it really had to go right away. So uh, the flow was uh, enormous, especially in intelligence and communications and uh, missiles and spare parts and, uh, 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 but it was, uh, it was a full on and yet kept pretty quiet. Uh, it, it was, it, it soon leaked out into the press that we were helping uh, the Brits, but there was no one really understood how, the, the huge volume that was involved. And so uh, that was how it all started. We soon, uh, after the Brits took many, many hits, they, they hit harder than they were hit and they prevailed. And, uh, and right away, of course, the media in the U.S. was uh, uh, promulgating the view as they do today after, uh, after cruise missiles sank the Moskva and uh, all of the uh, media about how great the Chinese and the Russians are. They've got all of these uh, hypersonic missiles and so forth. Uh, they. Uh, 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 we, had to, we had to get uh, 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 immediate uh, analysis of the lessons to be learned. And there were many lessons, many old lessons that were new to a, uh, uh, a, 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 a two navies that had forgotten them, really. And uh, uh, we found we did have the, the capability to deal with the exosets and with stream raids and and so forth. So, uh, and now we've got the world's greatest experts on that uh, logistics uh, enterprise and uh, on the lessons to be learned uh, and, uh, and how do we keep those uh, lessons alive today because, you know, as the old bromide says, uh, uh, if you don't learn the lessons of history, you. Uh, are doomed to repeat them. And we've got two, uh, what the, they think are superpowers, uh, uh, ready to reapply those lessons. So I will now turn it over to the people who really know what they're talking about. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Secretary Larry. This is a great, uh, uh, a great uh, scene setter here. I just wanna do a couple quick questions and then yep. we'll, we'll uh, have the panelists come up and, and join you after a quick break. Uh, First of all, you, you gave a, a great start there on the, the strategic and political aspects of this. But if you could say a little bit more about, you talked about Casper Weinberger and other folks uh, talking to Reagan on this, but how do you think about the decision making by both Thatcher and Reagan uh, when this conflict pop, popped up? I, I think it's the right way to decide in crises. Uh, we've had. <laughs> Uh, we've had some very good um, uh, presidents, uh, wartime presidents. Uh, we've had some very bad ones, uh, and I won't go through the catalog, but those who weren't afraid to make decisions, knowing the risk that they could be wrong in some uh, aspects, but knowing also that in, in war, you must decide uh, with what is available to you uh, when you feel you have 
uh, the probability and understand risk reward and make decisions. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was excellent at that. She made some mistakes, not, not necessarily in, the, in this uh, war, but uh, uh, she was decisive. Uh, but she wasn't a, a shoot from the hip decision maker, nor was Reagan, because Reagan really, uh, he was, had been studying national security a much longer time than people gave him credit for. And his instincts were, were brilliant and reliable for the military. And so I think both Margaret Thatcher and, uh, and Ronald Reagan should be models to study in understanding leadership and decision making. And it's no accident that two of them became fast friends because they understood each other. So, so the fact that they acted forcefully it would have been easy and the Argentinians probably expected they would blink. Uh, but what do you think that deterred longer down the road? Well, we now that was avoided. That was a very good question because we now know during that brief three-year period when there was a lot of opening of files and sharing of information with the, the Russians, uh, that it really changed their perception of of the balance of forces, or as they say, the correlation of forces, because they had basically written off the UK Navy after the Wilson administration. Uh, they were getting out of the Navy business. They were not, they didn't have sufficient funds to, for instance, buy A9Ls and a lot of other stuff. So they had really downgraded uh, their perception throughout the, the uh, uh, Russian military. Uh, that uh, on the scale of the military balance in NATO, uh, with NATO, the UK counted for very little. It just stunned them, uh, the performance of the Royal Navy in, uh, in the Falklands, going 8,000 miles away without any warning. And of course, you know, one of the lessons to be learned is they were surprised and they didn't have the logistics to do it, but they had an ally who, who did. But their performance was, was just so out of, the range of uh, Russian perception that they had to recalculate their whole, the whole balance of power. Uh, and so it had, it really helped end the Cold War sooner than it otherwise would have. So you alluded, you alluded uh, to the lessons learned. You talked about some of them. I wonder, especially with respect to the, the U.S. Navy, uh, what were the things that you implemented and you changed as a result of the conflict, as a result of the experience and and what you saw. Well, I, I think there are some here that can speak to that better than me, but I can tell you the, the highlights uh, were, first, uh, we had to reestablish the strength and the training. Training is so essential. You might have a strategy, but if you don't train to it, if you don't force those ships to go up in, in north of the Arctic Circle where the vulnerabilities of your enemies are and learn that you gotta send sailors up to chip the ice off the radars and you, you can't go uh, uh, above deck in certain weather without uh, losing people and you can't land a, an aircraft carrier uh, in certain kinds of uh, snowstorms. And uh, the only way you learn that is to go do it and uh, take the, the, the bruises that come with that. That was perhaps uh, the most important. Uh, and we uh, had to really test, real tests, not, not paper tests, academic tests or simulations, uh, how surface ships particularly can survive against uh, uh, stream raids, sea skimming missiles, hypersonic missiles, whatever. You've got to test it and learn the lessons and make the changes. Uh, the Navy, and uh, Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy, historically were very good at learning lessons and applying them. Uh, it so happened the U.S. built much better warships uh, uh, at the beginning of the uh, 19th century, 
uh, by using uh, uh, by using woods that were much uh, harder, like live oak, that were in effect armor plating, and that uh, by innovative design they could carry a m much heavier uh, cannon load uh, than than the British uh, ships, and the Brits learned from that, and well they couldn't find a way to get to get. Uh, 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 live oak uh, to build their ships. They changed their design philosophy and uh, and uh, learned a lot of lessons uh, that way. So, and they stayed. The the, the lessons uh, learned were kept and valued and passed on. And and both navies during the 19th century were very innovative in applying technology, the latest technology as it came into the commercial world. And that was definitely true uh, in, in leading right up to World War II, although they were, uh, the Japanese were uh, much better at some things than, than our intelligence uh, let, us, uh, let us know. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we learned uh, from the Falklands, relearned old lessons from World War II. After World War II, with all the battle damage, all, all the naval battles in the Pacific, that uh, you had to you had to get rid of Dacron and these uh, these other artificial uh, uh, cloth in the clothing that sailors wore and go back to cotton because the best fire retardant is cotton and uh, and so uh, we learned that lesson in World War II and applied it but then um, we. Uh, at the time of the Falklands, uh, because of the consolidation and the growth of the bureaucracy, there were those far detached from operations in the bureaucracy that said, what are, why are these stupid sailors spending three times as much for a flight suit as uh, we have had bids for? Uh, why do they have mattresses that they're paying uh, double what I can get them at uh, at my local uh, store, why are they why are they using this very expensive covering in all their tables and the mess decks and so forth? Uh, when we can we, we should have formica. It's a third of the cost, and uh, uh, all of these were bureaucracies that had grown since the Second World War in both sides of the Atlantic. That were mainly civilians that had little experience in operations. And so a lot of the lessons were ripped out of the consciousness of the institutions uh, by cost cutting and other, other reasons, more political reasons. But uh, uh, so we, one of the key lessons is, uh, because we found that, that all of our sailors had all of this crap in, their, in, in the ships. And it was a dangerous environment, and uh, not because the Navy asked for it. And uh, similarly, uh, they, uh, uh, well, that's, uh, uh, there are lots more of these lessons, and I can think we can hear more from that. Uh, it's, it's a great question. It's, uh, uh, it, it, it's perhaps a key challenge that we as free nations uh, face in a way that authoritarian nations don't necessarily do so. It takes us now 24 years to go from a concept of a new fighter to first operational squadron. It takes the Chinese seven years, it takes the Russians about seven years, mainly copying our, trying to copy our, our technology. So uh, we've got real challenges. We've let our bureaucracies grow so that they are stifling the inherent innovative advantage, technological advantage that the free world always will have. But it's being stifled in getting out to the cutting edge and hence deterring. Yeah. One final question, I can't help myself, but uh, you, know, you talked about uh, uh, the importance of layered defense. And I wonder, well, first of all, two years after the Falklands War, the, the Aegis ships start coming online under your tenure, and you know, Wayne Meyer starts pushing those out to the cruisers and the destroyers. And you talked about Sea Whiz and Sea Sparrows and all this kind of stuff. And that's, of course, come a long way uh, since then. 
I wonder if you could, could talk a little bit more about the philosophy of layered defense and just pull that string just a little bit more and then we're gonna hand it off to the panel after that. Yeah, layered defense is, is essential and it's one of our greatest vulnerabilities today because of the same people that changed our mattresses. Uh, they have reduced to cut costs, reduced at least three of the layers of our essential. It's based on the fact that no technology works 100% effectively. Uh, the best might be uh, in the area between 100 between 50 uh, percent and 80 percent. <laughs> that means that you cannot depend uh, on on just one defense against any uh, really threatening effective weapon. You have to have the layers. We learned that lesson uh, in almost every battle uh, in World War II. Certainly, uh, especially Okinawa, where we, we had uh, 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 our fleet at Okinawa was uh, attacked by 1,700 very smart cruise missiles. And it was adaptive. They, they learned our defenses and changed their tactics. Uh, we suffered many hits. We lost, in effect, in, most of them sunk, but we lost 35 destroyers. Uh, others survived, but uh, not, were, were not mission capable. Uh, we had uh, five carriers hit by kamikazes. Uh, one of them, the, the, uh, uh, the Franklin, was put out of action and couldn't operate. The others all s survived. None of them were sunk. Uh, but uh, we learned that we had very good thick defenses, close-in defenses, uh, we had uh, 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 the concept of an outer air battle, but we didn't really have enough to make this impervious. So, uh, so we took uh, a, a lot of losses, but we won. And uh, that's, you know, there is no magic weapon. There's no magic offensive weapon that lasts over time. There is no magic defensive weapons. Unfortunately, as I said, the seven layers that we, uh, we had uh, in the last years of the Cold War, uh, which convinced, and we know, we know because we, we were reading their mail, they could not cope with uh, our uh, seven layers because with Aegis deployed and the F-14s and the Phoenix, and the long range uh, uh, attack aircraft we had in the A-6, uh, they couldn't reach us because uh, the outer air battle was designed to kill the launcher, uh, not wait for uh, the, the, uh, SU, the, the uh, Soviet bears to launch their uh, cruise missiles. And, and so that was essential. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the bureaucracy not the Navy, the bureaucracy uh, in uh, uh, the uh, late 80s and early 90s canceled uh, all, all of the Navy's long range. So they lost f really four layers of the seven layer defense. And that's what we have today. We have short, only short range aircraft other than the E2C command uh, aircraft, which is essential uh, and works with the surface ships as well. Uh, we don't have any long range attack. We don't have any long range uh, interceptors at all. We retired the Phoenix missile, which was a hugely effective uh, missile and had not funded any replacement. And so we are vulnerable today. No, all of our ships, not carriers, the least vulnerable of all of them. Uh, because of their thousand watertight compartments and their three armored decks and blah, blah, blah. They're big ships, so a thousand pound warhead is not gonna sink a thousand, uh, uh, 10,000, a big ship. Yep. So. Well, Secretary Lambert, uh, this has been great. I appreciate your helping us uh, keep the memory alive. Also really appreciate the throwback to the er days of, of CSIS, uh, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, so we're gonna take a, a quick break. Uh, my colleague uh, Emily Harding will come back and moderate the, the next panel, but uh, thank you again, sir, appreciate it. Thank you, pleasure to be back.
I'm the Deputy Director of the International Security Program here at CSIS, and I am joined by what can only be called a distinguished panel on this particular topic. Uh, we have Will Dossel, who was a Naval Flight Officer with operational deployments worldwide. He was instrumental in tactics and doctrine development for the E2C, and if you ask him what his call sign is, he might tell you. Uh, now he is the Deputy Branch Head for IAM, IAMD Division's Intelligence Branch. It is a mouthful. Uh, his division is the Navy's primary authority and lead organization for Naval Joint and Coalition Integrated Air and Missile Defense Matters, which means he really knows what he's talking about on this set of issues. We also have Dov Zakheim, who has had a long national security career spanning government service and private sector experience. From 2001 to 2004, he was Under Secretary of Defense Comptroller and the CFO of DOD, which means he had all of the money and all of the people. Uh, he's advised multiple candidates for president and was the civilian point person on the Falklands crisis. So looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Now he's also a senior advisor here at CSIS and a senior fellow at CNA. Finally, we have Dr. Sebastian Bruns, who is an internationally recognized expert in naval and maritime security. Proving the international peace, he drafted the German Navy's capstone strategy in 2016 and now is the McCain Fulbright Scholar in Residence at the Naval Academy. And Secretary Lehman has agreed to join us on the panel, so we have him here as well to weigh in, which is a pleasure. So first we'll do some opening remarks from the gentleman in the middle. I believe it goes Will, Dove, and then Sebastian. So Will, over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, so in deference to my esteemed uh, panel members here, I'm going to focus at the operational to tactical level of war because it's important when we look at the range of threats that are out there today, but especially cruise missiles, which have become an enduring threat, that we see the impact that they have at all levels from operational planning down to individual ship tactics. And it's interesting that today uh, we find ourselves bookended by two other very interesting case studies. This October we'll celebrate, celebrate we'll uh, note the 55th anniversary of the first surface-to-surface -surface engagement with cruise missiles with the sinking of the Israeli destroyer Elat by Egyptian uh, SSN-2 Styx missiles. Jump forward to just a few weeks ago with the sinking of the largest ship yet, a capital ship, the Moskva, by coastal defense cruise missiles launched from the beach. And then, of course, back to what we're talking about today, the Falklands, with the sinking of the Sheffield by air-launched cruise missiles. Now, there is enduring lessons that we can draw from all three of those events and that we use as case studies uh, down at Dahlgren. Um, but first and foremost, each one of those three environments was in a littoral environment. And when you look at the fight in the, in the littoral environment, there are aspects of that that play to the strengths of a cruise missile and put a premium on things like intelligence, equipment, and training. And as we go through the discussion today, uh, I'd like to bring up elements of each of those um, that play in those cases and that carry forward into enduring lessons learned that we have today going forward. Okay. Great, thank you very much. It's a good initial lay down. I'm looking forward to discussing the, the tactics and the advances in technology and what lessons still apply today. Uh, Dove, over to you. Well, thanks very much. And uh, my association with CSIS goes back to uh, that maritime strategy group that Secretary Lehman talked about uh, in his remarks, uh, and at the time uh, Jimmy Carter was president, he had promised in his election campaign to get rid of a carrier, if you remember that, John, uh, and the Congress overruled him, thank God. <laughs> uh, but the same kind of cutback or mentality for cutbacks was going on in Britain. And one of the things that many people think actually triggered the Falklands War was the fact that Britain had had a ship out at the Falklands which it withdrew. And the Argentines concluded wrongly that uh, Britain was no longer interested. And in many ways, that's lesson one of the Falklands, which is be very careful about how you signal things. And that, of course, has a lot to do with our own uh, strategy, or Secretary Lehman would say absence of strategy uh, today, because as we cut back on the number of ships, we're below 300, uh, which is 
we're reaching historically low levels if we haven't already reached them. We've cut back on aircraft. We've cut back on just about everything. Um, what kind of signal are we sending to our uh, Chinese friends, for example? Uh, so that may be lesson number one. Be very careful about what you're signaling and how you're doing it. And that does go to budgets. And uh, as you heard, I was in charge of the budget in those days. And what's ironic, uh, not in those days, but uh, 20 odd years ago, what's ironic is the budget that I dealt with was $450 billion. It's now $770 billion. That's what's being requested. And yet, it turns out that's not enough because so much of that money goes to personnel. A lot of it goes to uh, standard operations. And yet, even in the operations accounts, we cut back on training. That has had a major impact, by the way, uh, on the Navy in particular. It's had a whole bunch of accidents due to lack of training. Uh, and as, again, as uh, John Lehman pointed out, training is critical. Uh, another lesson of the Falklands uh, that has total applicability today uh, is the logistics tale and the importance of logistics. And here, uh, I can tell a personal story about that. I've got lots of stories. If you want to ask me about them, I will. Older people are full of stories because they're <laughs> old. Um, the uh, attaché at the time, the British attaché at the time, was uh, Admiral Burgoyne. It may be a very familiar name to anybody who knows American history. I suspect our British friends prefer to forget it. Uh, but in 1777, we defeated his ancestor at Saratoga. Anyway, Gen Admiral Burgoyne comes in to tell me that uh, they have a real problem. This is already in the course of the For Falklands War. They do not, Britain does not want to spend money on equipment that it might not need. Uh, as you already heard from Secretary Lehman, Britain had cut back on its budgets. It had cut back significantly on its, it tried actually to do even more than it had uh, in the uh, early 1980s, 1981, uh, Britain wanted to close the Chatham shipyard. It wanted to get rid of Hermes and Invincible, uh, which played a major role in the Falklands War. And I was involved in uh, actually delaying it until the war began. We didn't know the war would begin, but I was certainly uh, leading the group that tried to delay it. In any event, uh, the British didn't have money. And they didn't want to just spend it on things they might not use. So I suggested to him that uh, what we would do, since we both shared a uh, wide awake airfield on Ascension Island, uh, the, the British would tell me what they needed or thought they needed. And at that point, I would get it shipped down to Ascension. Uh, I was in charge of coordinating all the supplies to the British. Uh, I reported pretty much directly to Mr. Weinberger because the uh, various uh, officials above me either were not interested or were sympathetic to Argentina. Uh, that was not me. Uh, that was not Mr. Weinberger. In my case, uh, I'd fallen in love with Britain when I'd been at Oxford. And by the way, one of the smartest things Britain's ever done is have Rhodes scholarships, even though you went to Cambridge and I went to Oxford. <laughs> and but my son also went to Cambridge, so don't worry about that, John. Um, but the fact is that Rhodes Scholarships and such type of scholarships with the UK uh, means that you get a lot of policymakers to this day who've spent time in Britain. And that, I think, is one of the glues, not the only one, but one of the glues of the special relationship. In any event, uh, Burgoyne liked that idea, but it filtered up to uh, Secretary Weinberger. And he, being the Anglophile that he was, uh, called uh, Minister of Defense, Secretary of State for Defense, John Knott, to ask him if it was OK. Knott, of course, said, of course it was OK, because this way, uh, Britain would only pay for what it took out of our warehouses and not for what it asked for. Um, I found out about that. And uh, I went to see the Secretary of Defense's military assistant, Carl Smith, at the time. And I said, please tell the secretary, he may be an Anglophile. I have relatives there. That was the last time I ever got caught out by the secretary of defense, who uh, at some point uh, became, became quite close. Um, um, the lesson of logistics is absolutely critical. And the lesson of supply, which I was in charge of, is critical. One, those two lessons both appear in the uh, study that uh, Secretary Lehman commissioned and that I was on the steering group of, and they apply today. Uh, 
we can, you know, <laughs> it was three and a half, roughly three and a half thousand miles to Ascension Island from Britain and another three and a half thousand miles from uh, Ascension Island to the Falklands. How do you manage that kind of long supply line? That would be our issue because the United States is an island nation and we have interests all over the world. With the kind of forces we have, logistics become absolutely critical. Uh, there's a major debate going on right now. The, the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps wants to have a completely new approach to what the Marines should do, have small groups out in the Pacific on islands uh, to hit the Chinese where they don't expect to be hit. Well, how do you do that without the logistics? Major issue. Uh, supply. We had a supply, the British, not just with AIM-9Ls, uh, but with lots of other pieces of equipment, some, most of which I can't still talk about. Uh, but you always underestimate how much you're going to use. And that, again, was something that John Lehman's study uh, talked about. And we still make that mistake to this day. And finally, uh, and this goes to the Rhodes Scholarships, it goes to the relationship we had, the Royal Navy, the, uh, the U.S. Navy, and, and generally, um, the special relationship is really special. But we have other allies as well, and with, a, with forces that have shrunk as much as they have, we now need those allies in a very big way. Uh, and uh, if we are to succeed, even if we were to increase our own force levels, we couldn't do it without our allies. We now face two major superpowers, one a nuclear superpower, the other one both nuclear and conventional, um, on both sides of the world. What do we do if we don't have allies? And again, um, we have some very special allies and we should never discount that relationship. It is critical, it has been critical for decades. Um, the British have fought alongside us every time since World War II, and of course in World War II, not too many other countries have done that. Right, and I love stories. Stories are how we learn, <clears throat> so I appreciate all the stories. Uh, Sebastian, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, CSI for setting up this panel today because 40 years today, this morning, HMS Sheffield uh, was hit by uh, Exocet missiles and subsequent, subsequently was lost. Um, so as if we had needed another reason, um, the Moskva incident uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, re uh, reiterated the use um, and the, the timeliness of such a discussion to have uh, today. Um, and I want to thank the, uh, the Fulbright Commission for bringing me over here I'm, uh, uh, at the, to, to the Naval Academy. But of course, I'm, what I'm about to say is my own personal opinion and uh, not that of any institution that I am affiliated with, nor the Ministry of Silly Walks or uh, anything else. But what, I, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to wear my, my European hat. Um, and Dov, thank you for raising the, the issue of allies. Um, because I want to point out that European navies collectively um, have not really learned the lessons from the, from the Falklands War. As a matter of fact, because of the political evolution of the 1990s and 2000s, not only have they downscaled massively, um, but they've also engaged, because of security politics of the time, in low-end, medium-intensity operations. Um, because sea control, there was no sea control challenger. There was no anti-ship missile challenge, um, at least nothing to, to speak of, really. And... Um, they, for the German Navy, for instance, they, they, they got themselves involved um, in embargo operations in the Adriatic Sea, uh, in counter piracy and anti terrorism operations, uh, lately in uh, um, uh, the rescue of refugees from the, in the Mediterranean Sea. And that certainly not just goes for the German Navy, but also for a lot of allied navies um, in, uh, in Europe as well. Um, and since 2014, with the uh, what we now know is just a preface of uh, the war that we're currently seeing, Russia's aggressive uh, and illegitimate uh, campaign against Ukraine, uh, the taking, the annexation of Crimea and the, uh, the beginning of the civil war in eastern Ukraine, the German Navy, as much as a, a number of European navies, suddenly fought, found themselves having to relearn what navies are actually for. Um, that navies can do all these kind of low-end missions and low-end operations, medium-intensity operations, but that's not exactly what they built for. Um, and um, so here we are, eight years later, eight years after this, um, after this last turning point in, in European history, uh, or in international security, I should say. Um, and um, 
the conversation is more more timely than than, than ever um, to relearn the, the 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 roles and missions, the functions of navies, um, to relearn the the operational, the tactical, and the uh, the mindset issues that are related to uh, the sharp end of the stick, the sharp end of the spear. Um, it comes at a difficult time because European navies, certainly the German navy, um, is just now, and Secretary Lehman mentioned, the, the long lead times that we have um, also in Europe for new, pro, new programs, new ships. Uh, we're just commissioning four um, Baden-Württemberg class frigates, which were conceptualized in the 2000s. They are perfect for anti-piracy and counterterrorism mi missions. Uh, they do carry harpoons, but they are not exactly the kind of ship that you would put into, uh, into harm's way. Um, and that leads me to the other point I'd like to make. Um, aside from the operational and the tactical learnings, relearnings, there's also the political dimension. Um, and Will mentioned um, the littoral uh, environments that we're, we're seeing uh, in the world. Uh, and I would submit to you that the Baltic Sea, which is Germany's uh, front yard, so to speak, maritime for, for front yard, it probably only rivals the South China Sea in terms of the littoral uh, aspects that it has. Um, and that's the conversation that, um, uh, given the, the, uh, the dynamics that, that we're seeing, uh, we don't ha yet have. What happens in the Baltic Sea really when the balloon goes up? Um, and um, is the German government, is NATO, is our allies um, anticipating ship losses? Because we will lose ships in the Baltic Sea unless we pull them all out in the case of, uh, of, a, of a major conflict. Um, and certainly that's the kind of conversation some of as some of the aspects are classified or should be confidential at least. But I think there's, there's merits to a, a public approach to have these issues study aggressively as much as possible in a public forum or on panels like this uh, to inform and to, uh, p policymakers and to f inform the broader public um, about um, the, again, the roles and missions of navies, um, a public that's been getting used to an ever-shrinking navy or ever-shrinking navies in that case, plural, and navies that do counter-piracy, counter-terrorism, and all these missions that make sense to the broader public. But the broader public, I think, and certainly academia and policymakers need to understand what navies are for. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate the laydown and also the strong endorsement of a Navy. I think America has proven over and over again <clears throat> how critically important our Navy is to our national strategies. Also, our panel on the Ministry of Silly Walks, I believe is after this panel, so <laughs> if you wanna stick around for that. Uh, Secretary Lehman, you wanna add anything here before we move to questions? No, it's uh, uh, undiluted wisdom <laughs> from uh, all three. That's what we're going for, undiluted wisdom. Uh, I love the title of this panel, Falklands at 40. 40 years feels like a long time, but at the same time in the life of an aircraft carrier or a foreign policy professional, it's not actually that long. And it's just long enough that we need to remind ourselves of the tactical and strategic lessons that were learned in the conflict, um, pass them on to the next generation. So I wanted to start off with the strategic question, with the um, strategic calculations of two world leaders, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and then also the Argentinians and the decisions that they made in the lead up to the war, and how those might apply today, both in what we're seeing in Ukraine and also for a potential future conflict we all wish to avoid in the South China Sea. So Dove, I'll turn to you first to talk a little bit about the policy process in Washington and how the decisions were made that fit into this bigger strategic picture. Well, the policy process was not how decisions were made on the Falklands. Um, the policy process involves layers upon layers of uh, what are called chopping on memoranda, uh, what uh, the Secretary of the, the Secretary Lehman was inveighing against, so I won't repeat that. But what happened here uh, with respect to the Falklands and what tends to happen when you really have a crisis is that all of a sudden there are shortcuts. In, in the case of the Falklands, uh, you heard about uh, Secretary Weinberger going to see the president, John Lehman going to see Cap Weinberger. Um, I was dispatched, uh, and the reason I got involved in this is because I had been leading, uh, as I mentioned, a delegation which was called the Zakheim Power Talks. It had nothing to do with Mike Power. The guy I was dealing with was a man named Michael Power, who was the assistant <laughs> undersecretary of the Navy. But if everybody thought it was me being powerful, that was great. Uh, I was very junior. And uh, as I said, my superiors, until Weinberger himself, uh, were either apathetic or sympathetic to Argentina. So I became the guy, based on the uh, 
these talks that had been going on for about a year and that did save Hermes and Invincible and uh, kept Chatham uh, Shipyard open at least for a while, uh, to be the guy to sort of set in motion our support for the UK should the White House issue the OK to do it. And so I was going over to uh, London on a weekly basis, which was fine because I love the city. Um, but because I was so junior and I was so under the radar, and because obviously we didn't want Mr. Haig to know about this, um, <laughs> nor for that reason the, our ambassador to uh, the uh, Court of St. James, uh, I would have to take a taxi to Lund to, uh, uh, to the, I used to stay, I guess, at uh, the Royal Horse Guards Hotel, which if you know London is like a hop, skip and jump from the Ministry of Defense. Uh, and I was meeting with uh, Peter Blaker, who later became Lord Blaker, who was the Minister of State at the time. So you get this really junior guy meeting with a Minister of State, which is kind of fun for the junior guy. I'm not so sure it was so much fun for Blaker. Um, and uh, the taxi drivers would give me hell because why aren't you helping us? Why aren't you doing these things for us? We fought alongside you. We always fight alongside you. And I would get this every week until we went public. Um, but this got this all laid pretty much in a row, okay? And so this wasn't the standard policy process, by definition. <laughs> Secretary of State is totally in the dark. Secretary of Defense is dispatching this junior guy to run off and do whatever he's doing. Uh, and essentially, there are pluses and minuses to this kind of shortcutting. The plus is you can actually get everything done. The minus is you could be dead wrong about what you're doing. Uh, and we've seen that happen as well. Uh, one could argue, for instance, that Iraq involved shortcutting, shortcutting and we weren't exactly successful in Iraq. Uh, and so um, the policy process, the reason you have the shortcutting, to answer your question directly, is because the policy process is just so ponderous and uh, when we have a crisis, and we could have more than one, people say that our government can't walk and chew gum at the same time, and there's some degree of truth to that. But that's because of the bureaucracy. Everything has to be approved level after level after level after level. So unless you shortcut it, unless you get a Secretary of Defense or a Secretary of State or a National Security Advisor who can walk into the President's office and say, look, I don't care about all this other stuff, this is what you need to do. And if that person is correct, which may or may not be the case, uh, you've got a problem. Do you need some expert backup? Of course you do. Do you need the zillions of layers that we have? Absolutely not. Right. Uh, the Washington phrase, where there's a will, there's a waiver, holds true just as much today as it did 40 years ago. Um, Sebastian, let's talk a little bit about the maritime strategy and tactics piece, and especially NATO today and NATO investments today. Um, are we doing things we need to do to learn the lessons from the Falklands, to be prepared for this littoral strategy? Uh, how can we, as a group of countries working together, make strategic purchases so we're not duplicating each other's strengths? Mm. That's, a, that's an excellent point. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I, my first uh, ref reflex is it depends who you ask in, or who you look at inside NATO. NATO Maritime Command would say, we're on track, we're doing the right things. I'm not so sure about SHAPE and NATO headquarters in Brussels um, because they are still very much, very much fundamentally uh, Army and Air Force driven. Uh, no offense to Army and Air Force colleagues, but the mindset is, is, is different. Um, and uh, let's not forget NATO is coming off of 20 years of fighting um, to some degree or another, NATO member states, I should say, of fighting uh, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan. Um, so turning around a mindset is, is no small feat. Um, and then you've got all these individual countries who have uh, strategic cultures of, of their own, uh, strategic limit, limitations, uh, as the case of my home country, uh, where even the 100 billion euros that have been earmarked will not buy us a new strategic culture, even if we set up a military or fund a military that's then worthy, more worthy of a name, of its name. Um, and for many good reasons, um, there's a term called sea blindness, and I believe the British gave it to us, which uh, is striking because of, uh, of the island nation sea power history um, uh, and geography of, of Great Britain. Um, and that very much, very much holds true in 
all of, all of Europe, um, all of NATO Europe. Um, and NATO, of course, has evolved as well. It used to be this maritime NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, but with various uh, uh, um, evolutions since the end of the Cold War, it's added Eastern European states who are very much conscious about one thing, that's Russia. Or three things, I should say. Russia, Russia, Russia. <laughs> um, and that's not a maritime mindset. Um, and then you've got the issue of the northern flank and the, uh, and the southern flank, where maritime problems are also vastly different. Uh, in the south, as famously a previous NATO Marcom Admiral or commander uh, stated it, it's the three R's, refugees, radicals, and Russia. And in the north, it's also three R's, Russia, Russia, Russia. Um, at the crosshairs, uh, certainly that you've got NATO Europe as well as NATO North America. So lots of, lots of uh, uh, dim dimensions here to, to, to take care of. Um, and I'm, so, I'm not so sure that a top-down approach from NATO is, is the way to go forward. I think there's uh, merits to think about bilateral, trilateral, um, so coalitions of the willing who will go forward in, uh, in, in creating that kind of uh, uh, thrust that both reaches the NATO headquarters in Brussels, uh, NATO in Mons, um, and also um, combats that kind of sea blindness that we have in a lot of member states, uh, or selective sea blindness, as in the case of, as I've laid out in Germany, uh, seeing the Navy as sort of a, a, a police force uh, with bigger guns. Um, because what we're risking is, um, and my, my final comment here on this, on this question, um, or my final answer, um, we're not just risking sea blindness, we're risking sea amnesia, because we're forgetting the, the lessons of the, of the past, and we're, we're forgetting uh, the, the, the lessons of the Falklands, the lessons and the evolutions of the last 40 years, as well as the con constants. I mean, I've been telling my midshipmen as they uh, join the fleet um, and get commissioned this summer, that they'll operate on systems that have been introduced in the 1980s. Um, for good or for bad, and that's the kind of an, uh, that's the kind of continu continuity that long before they were born, these systems have been have been uh, in operation. So lots of dynamics, lots of levels to that interact, um, and it's it, it is a persistent task. It is a it never stops <laughs> combating sea blindness, uh, making maritime strategy, operationalizing it. Uh, Criticizing it, thinking it through, rewriting it is a is an eternal process uh, almost, and uh, yeah, thanks. Eternal process with very long time horizons. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to build a ship or a submarine. We've got to think ahead for these things. Um, so I think. See, avoiding sea amnesia is a great headline for, for this particular panel between Secretary Layman's comments and your comments about being sure we actually learn the lessons. It's, it's a critical point. Uh, let's turn to you, Will, to talk about the specific threat of anti-ship missiles. Um, you can talk a little bit about the Moskva and how the lessons from the Falklands may have applied to what happened there, but then also just looking ahead, the kinds of wars that the U.S. might be fighting in the near future, hopefully along with our NATO allies, what lessons are we supposed to be taking away? Are we prepared? Thank you very much. Uh, so to answer that question, let's walk through that engagement of 40 years ago. And there are lessons that can be pulled from each one of those steps inside this engagement that I think can be brought forward to today. So let's start first with the threat. Intel guy, what do you expect? <laughs> so what was the threat? Well, according to the best intelligence at the time, they knew that the Argentines had Super Atendards, so there was an air threat. They knew that they had received Exocet missiles, but the French technicians who were supposed to integrate those missiles with the Super Atendards had been pulled out of Argentina before that had happened. And so the intelligence at the time was that the threat was going to be iron bombs, which meant that the aircraft had to get within visual range and get into the very heart of the envelope of the anti-air weapons that the task force had. All right, so the known unknown, to borrow a phrase, was were the exosets actually integrated to the super atendards and were the air crew trained to be able to utilize the exoset? Well, obviously the answer was yes. And it bespeaks uh, a degree of technical capability on the part of the Argentines that they were able to do that. We go forward today ignoring the same kind of technical capabilities of 
let's call them lesser adversaries, non-peer adversaries that are out there, we tend to sort of discount, well, yeah, well, they just copied it and they can't do this and they can't do that, right up until we find out that, oh, yeah, mm, they can do that. Okay, <clears throat> the environment. The ship, the Sheffield was designed for the North Atlantic fight, blue water fight. Low clutter, long range, the missiles that were on board were optimized for the big, fast, high diving missiles that the Soviets had at the time, things like the AS-4 off of the Backfire or the SSN-12 coming off of the Slava class like the MOSFA. The environment that they found themselves in was a littoral environment near land, relatively near land. Um, so you were getting significant clutter effects from the land and from the meteorology at the time as well. Um, the so what factor to that is that was causing any one of a number of false alarms over the periods of minutes, hours, days. That has a debrading effect on combat readiness of the watch teams that you have on board. It ends up with things like the force anti-air warfare coordinator on board the Invincible discounting reports of, hey, I, I think I may have a Super 800 on this bearing because I have an emitter, a, a snapshot of the emitter on that aircraft on this bearing. No, it's just clutter and discounted. <clears throat> so you have the threat, the environment. What was the support for the threat? The support for the threat was an ancient P-2 Neptune. Special mission aircraft are critical in the littorals as they are in the blue water environment because they provide the targeting information to be able to get the missiles into the targeting basket where their own seekers can then take over, find the target, and engage it. Look, 1967 to 2022. Over 245 cruise missile engagements have occurred during that time frame. However, out of that 245 plus engagements, only half actually found a target, and that target wasn't necessarily the intended target. And of those that were actually struck, only about 30% actually sank. So special mission aircraft help get the target, get the missiles into the basket to find the target and try and raise that, that piece of cake. Okay, <clears throat> what about the equipment on board Sheffield? So the radars that were on Sheffield were affected by the clutter. The crew that was on Sheffield was focused on a threat that was visual in nature, shorter range in nature, wasn't looking for the cruise missile, so that when a report came in on board ship of wait a minute, there may be something here, and the bridge says, I have smoke on the port quarter. One second, two second, three seconds, four seconds later, impact. Four seconds from identification of something that's out there until impact. That's what we're kind of facing in the littoral environment today. Missiles that come out that are not necessarily uh, active at the time. They have targeting information that's been passed to them by a sophisticated and growing <coughs> theater reconnaissance strike complex or advanced sea denial systems that include everything from overhead to drones and that we find inside the first island chain, we find in the Eastern Mediterranean, we find in the Red Sea, and we find in the Gulf, okay? <clears throat> These missiles that are then able to take this large dump of information and then wait until it gets to very short range to actually activate and engage. And at that point, let's say, let's just say for example, 10 miles, okay? 10 miles out flying at uh, you know, 50 to 60 feet above the waves. What is the warning time that a ship has that something is inbound when it activates at 10, sec at 10 miles out? You have at Mach 0.8, 1.1 minutes from the time you get an activation until impact. What is that missile in the meantime doing inbound during that time frame? 
Look at the Moskva. The public images that you see, uh, you can do a very, start to do a very detailed uh, decomposition of what may have occurred on board Moskva. So you have an impact whole uh, center of mass, which is where the missiles are going to most likely go, center of mass of the ship, and ironically, almost directly underneath the AK-630s, which is their equivalent of CWES. Along the, the port side of Moskva are arranged any one of a number of defensive electronic countermeasures. Were those active? Was the AK-630 active? Most likely not because of the impact. What about the onboard missiles? Well, when you look back aft at the top dome radar for the SCN-6 radar, it's in the aft stowed position. It does not look like it was activated or engaged. The pop group radar that goes with the SCN-8 on the port side. The SCN-8 was obviously not utilized because there's no scorch marks, no burn marks to show that the missile had launched. The pop group radar is oriented aft. All intents and purposes, it looks like Moscow was just as surprised as Sheffield was 40 years ago. What was the combat condition on board Moscow at the time? Okay. What was the crew training? What were the operational command philosophies that were in place at the time? What were the war fighting orders that were in place at the time? When the Exocet hit the, uh, the Sheffield, it shattered the main fire main. And that was the chief reason why damage control, especially firefighting, was not effective on board Sheffield. Five years later, the Stark took two Exocets, and we know that at least one of those warheads detonated. But the other you know, nasty little part about cruise missiles is there's a lot of unburnt fuel that remains. And when that unburnt fuel continues to ignite and combust the materials inside the space, you can get internal temperatures upwards of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Stark was able to save the ship because of redundancy in the fire main and the rigorous kind of training that we went through in the 1980s for damage control. I still remember my time in shipboard firefighting and flight deck firefighting in Norfolk. It was miserable. It was the <laughs> middle of winter in Norfolk. But I knew that if we got hit when I was on Ike, I knew what I had to do from a damage control standpoint and that we were going to be able to do it going forward. So just you know, a couple of points there to, to you know, bring forward lessons from 40 years ago, 55 years ago, three weeks ago. Let me jump in with, uh, to expand on your very first point about underestimating uh, the enemy. Uh, clearly, the Russians underestimated the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. particularly we know now in the EW sphere, the electronic warfare sphere. On the other hand, we've overestimated the Russians. <laughs> okay. What that tells me, and I've seen this over and over again in, in, in my career, there's a tendency to straight line. Mm -hmm. You take what you know and you say, this is what's going to be in the future. That is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. And it, it's really a, it's a manifestation of a certain intellectual laziness. And it, it's not only our intelligence people who have to avoid that. It, it's the planners. It's the programmers. Uh, it's industry. It's industry. Yeah. You cannot continue and say what's, what happened yesterday is going to happen tomorrow. The reason is it never does. Well, that's a great point. Uh, we didn't get to talk enough today about the importance of a professional military and the training and the, the practicing that's required to really execute in these times of crisis. Um, save that for another panel, but a shout out there for our professional military colleagues. Um, we are out of time, and I want to do one quick lightning round for each of you, and that is if you were going to give one lesson from the last 40 years and hand it to the United States Navy and say, fix this and fix it now, here's your magic wand, what are you fixing? What advice would you give? Will seems to know. Okay, go ahead, Will. So advertisement for, for my day job. <clears throat> give me the tools, give me the resources for operationally realistic training. 1982, Ready X, Northern Puerto Rican Op Area, two carrier battle groups. 
over the course of a 12-hour vulnerability period at any point in time, there is going to be one or more Fire V drones released for engagement, real-world engagement with jamming, by the way, comm jamming and radar jamming. And we had to find the missile and shoot it. Give me the resources that I can take my fleet and go out and do that today. Real world training, absolutely. If I could add something um, to the military, not, do not just draw on the expertise and the studies that you do, uh, that military or uniform people do. Draw on historians, draw on political scientists, draw on experts in the, from the policy field, uh, because there's so much talent, certainly in our allied uh, environment, um, that you can you can draw on and so much knowledge. Um, and if you don't draw on that, you do it at your own peril. And I'll build on the points that have been made. Uh, remember that it's not just a matter of having allies; it's a matter of working with them, being able to communicate with them, being able to. <laughs> interchange your equipment with them, mm. being able to train with them, and not just go through the motions, but realistic training, the kind of stuff that Secretary Lehman uh, pushed in Oceans Ventured, where you really are testing your allies as opposed to going through kind of a rote memory kind of drill. Um, alliances are crucial for us, but they have to be meaningful. Secretary Lehman, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I would just uh, concentrate on two lessons um, that uh, are, are critical, I believe, today. Everyone, this has been a great uh, panel that has brought to attention the specific things that need to be executed to change our vulnerabilities today. But first and foremost, we need a strategy. And we don't have a strategy. I haven't, haven't had strategy for, well, 30 years, maybe? Literally, we haven't. <clears throat> so now, having been given uh, by a license uh, by Dove uh, as an anecdotalist, um, let me say what happened and where did we come, how did we come about having a strategy to win the Cold War? First, Right here in CIS, in a different building, CSIS, uh, over about five years, navalists had developed a strategy. And it had many manifestations, but there was a consensus. Then we got a president who, uh, it's been recorded in many circles, but during uh, during the lead up to uh, the 80 campaign, Dick Allen, his national security advisor, asked him, uh, well, uh, what, when you are asked this question, what is your strategy for the Cold War? He said, without hesitation, my strategy is very simple. We win, they lose. <laughs> And so that immediately opened up for people who really understood and had been keeping the, the strategy dialogue alive. Everybody woke up in, in the predecessor to the SNG today and said, wow, we've, got, we've really got something here. And so they provided, um, uh, when the president was elected, they provided him with a winning strategy because that's what he said he wanted. And so, again, a second uh, dimension of that aspect <clears throat> is that uh, having this strategy, first, a lot, all of this is inter intertwined. Unlike today, where it takes a year for presidents to get their uh, team in place, the senior Pentagon people were at their desks through Senate confirmation uh, and uh, uh, sworn in about two weeks after the inauguration. I was sitting at my desk confirmed February 5th after January 20th. And so we were able to really get going right away as soon as we were in, in fact, starting before that. <clears throat> so uh, we had the, the strategy and uh, uh, we went to uh, 
then president-elect, this was before the swearing in, but I, I and the senior people had been named and were awaiting Senate confirmation. We explained the Navy strategy uh, and uh, uh, he really liked it. We said, you know, we've got to first uh, uh, demonstrate and make public and demonstrate to the Soviets that we have a strategy and here's what we're gonna do. And of course, many of the admirals were, oh, you can't tell them what we're gonna do. How are we gonna surprise them in a war? You know, don't tell them what we, that we can do this and do that. And, and uh, we said, no, you have, the name of this game is deterrence. No point if you have magic moves and they don't know about it, you're not gonna deter them. So we explained we intended to have a fleet large enough to go into those areas that we had not gone into for 20 years, partially because the, the common wisdom was uh, their, uh, NATO won't let us go north of the GI-UK gap because that will upset detente. And there was a certain amount of truth to that. But navies <clears throat> were part of the problem. They didn't want to go up there. It's nasty up there. It's tough. It's tough to fly. You get severe icing. You get 100 knot downdrafts. You, it's, it's scary. And uh, driving a destroyer up there where the comma seas you're going to see are like three to six foot swells. And uh, Willy was and ice uh, uh, and sudden unpredicted uh, uh, snow squalls. You have to teach your sailors, they've got to be able to climb up that mast even though it's covered with ice, not rime ice, but glaze ice with a hammer and knock that ice off the equipment. And God help you if you fall into those uh, 40 degree uh, seas. So uh, we hadn't been up there really and didn't know how to operate up there. And so we had to go up there to show them we could do it. And we believed we could do it. And Reagan really loved that. And he said, that's great. But he said, how do we show the Russians, how do we show the Soviets that we're serious? This is not just the policy. They, the ambassador came by with a Republican uh, platform which says we're gonna build a 600 ship Navy and he was talking as if this is sort of classic politics, you know, goes this way, goes that way. We have gotta make them understand that this is real. We are gonna kick their ass. <laughs> that was the president speaking. And, it's direct quote, uh, so it's fine. <laughs> so I, I was able to say, uh, Mr. President, we got a good deal for you. Yeah. Because NATO, every year, had a huge naval exercise, 250 some ships every year. Every year they did the exact same thing, starting in the med, coming across, but never going up to scare the Russians in the Norwegian Sea. And uh, I said, we, all we have to do is you give us the word and we will turn left, because it always really started in Norfolk. And uh, when we get to the Davis Strait, let us go left, turn left and keep going up into the Norwegian Sea, around the North Cape and operate up there. And we can do this in seven months from now. We're gonna do it in August. And he said, yeah, that, I didn't know you could do that. That's great. I said, there's one, one uh, issue, though, that you have to understand. We can't tell the Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> and he said, well, how can you do that? Why, why, why can you do that? Because the staff, the Joint Staff, is 6,000 people. And they are uh, buried in an orthodoxy. All the Navy can do is carry beans and bullets to, to the real war. And it will leak within minutes. You'll read it in the Washington Post. So let us do that. Because the reason we haven't gone north is there's no law, there's no executive order. It's just presidents have been afraid to do it because it'll upset the, the Russians. He, he, and he said, oh, 
okay. And, and then I said, there's one more thing. We can't tell NATO because shape leaks even more than, uh, than the, the Pentagon. And so we can't tell them. We just have to go do it. And he said, well, I thought you said the Europeans and the Royal Navy and the French were all going to be part of this. He said, yeah, we have no problem with them because they never tell their ministries anything. <laughs> and everybody at shape uh, thinks that Ships are solid, like when they're toys when they were kids. They didn't know they're hollow, you know. They don't know what the Navy's doing and they don't care because they don't think it counts at all. So he laughed and he said, great, let's do it. <laughs> and so we did Ocean Venture and went north and uh, this guy was uh, a participant. Uh, Ace Lyons and Jerry Tuttle, who was, uh, his right hand uh, sent a flight, and the intelligence had provided us with information that at the same time, uh, there, uh, the uh, Russians were uh, 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 doing a massive exercise uh, right off Murmansk and out of the White Sea. And so Ace sent four F-14s, four A-6s, and four tankers up a thousand miles. Today we couldn't do it more than 300 miles because we only have short-legged airplanes and not enough tankers. But then we could do it a thousand miles from the Dwight Eisenhower. And uh, we, they blew through at 550 knots the exercise 13 miles off uh, Murmansk. And the Russians were gobsmacked. They had no idea. Where did that come from? They didn't know even that there was a carrier in, in the Norwegian Sea. And that changed the whole dynamic because uh, we, uh, he was running the, uh, the strike, <clears throat> but uh, we, we, we demonstrated to them and not just once, through that whole exercise, we had a, a total of 83 ships, I think, up in the Norwegian Sea and a couple of uh, surface ships up around the North Cape, which they hadn't been for many years. And the, the Soviets, they, they, they just couldn't, they couldn't cope with thinking about it. They couldn't get their head around it. How did this happen? Secretary Taylor, I'm going to stop you there just because we're running way over time. I would listen to this story all day because okay, I'm learning sorry. so much. But Doug warned you, you know, we're in our <laughs> anecdotage, so. I, I, I love all the stories. Um, I think it's also a critical point to end on, which is that sometimes you need to break out of those silos. You need to break out of the thinking that's been governing your actions for so long and then try something new. Turn left, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really strong point to end on. Um, I want to thank our audience for listening in. I want to thank our colleagues from the British Embassy who came along today. We have two of our uh, attache friends in the audience, appreciate it, representing again the continuation of the special relationship, and also an Argentinian-American staffer at CSIS, so bringing peace within the room even today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, thank you for the insights, gentlemen, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Falklands at 50, anybody? We'll get back together. <laughs> Thanks a lot.